Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to you all here in the Blaue Saal. Welcome to the lecture, Happy Sex. Well, I'm not surprised that we have such a big turnout because, of course, that's an interesting topic. Um, but it's not always self-evident, happy sex, and that's what we'll be discussing today. I just want to let you know before we start that you can see some cameras here. We will be recording this lecture. It's not a live stream, but we will be recording it. You will not be visible in the live stream. However, if you ask a question, you will be audible. And that's why we also have an option today to ask your question anonymously via the Mentimeter code that you can see here. Uh, this lecture is organized by Sumi Generale, but at the initiative of and together with uh, one of the fraternities of study association, Gewis. Uh, and I'd first like to uh, introduce you to Anna van der Velze from uh, uh, Davy. It's Davy. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Uh, indeed, I'm Anna. I'm from fraternity uh, Davy from the study association Gewis. And our cornerstone is to get people out of their comfort zone. And this also includes talking about taboos. And as already mentioned, sex is uh, kind of a <laughs> taboo that people like to talk about. And we think it's very important that uh, consent and stuff like that um, is something people are comfortable talking about. Uh, and therefore, we have invited Lieve Lisette uh, to give this lunch lecture. Um, she is already, she's working as a sex worker for 11 years <laughs> and she's already uh, quite acquainted in uh, talking about this topic in the media. So uh, here she is, Lieve Lisette. Wow, hello. <laughs> it's great to see so many people wanted to come here and see how they can have happier sex. Um, as she told me, uh, as she told you, I'm a sex worker. Uh, and I also call myself uh, intimate coach, intim intimacy coach, and a pleasure activist. And before I want to talk to you about how you can have happier sex, I want to explain to you what these definitions mean to me. Maybe you know, or maybe you don't know, but sex work is an umbrella term. It's like saying, I'm into software or finances. It doesn't really say what I do, but it says something about the general topic of my work. I can be a stripper, I can be a call girl, I can sell my panties online, and I can be a prostitute, like an escort, as I am. And an escort is someone who goes to the clients themselves. I go to their homes, to their hotel room. I visit them on their location. And the easiest way to work as an escort is to an agency. And that's how I started when I was 20 years old. <sighs> Thank you. <sighs> For some glass of water. Thank you. Being in my body is one of the things of feeling more pleasure. That's something I need to do now. Okay. I started as an escort when I was 20 years old through an agency. And if you're really interested about knowing how I started as an escort and what journey that was for me, maybe you can listen to my podcast. It's called Leave a to the podcast. Uh, but for now, I'm not going to tune in that long about my journey. Um, but I do want to tell is that after a few years, I thought by myself, well, there's a better way of doing this. And that's why I started my own agency and had other escorts working for my company. During the day, I was planning their appointments. And in the evening, I was working as an escort myself, which was a really busy thing to do. And then in 2015, I got back problems and I needed surgery. And after surgery, I needed to have three months of rest. And during this rest time, I noticed I wanted more uh, time for personal development. So I started studying psychology. And after a few years of that, also running an agency, I noticed I wanted more time for that. And that's why I quit the agency and started fully working for myself. 
and had more time to read books, do some courses, and learn about sexuality, intimacy, and the place in society for this. And while I was personally growing, my clients grew with me, because I was learning some skills and applied them during my dates with them. And that's when I start calling myself an intimacy coach. And really, I'm accompanying them in their journey, accompany, um, accompanying, like joining someone, escorting, that was my point, uh, but escorting, well, I use the term intimacy coach because of marketing reasons, it's clearer what I do, uh, but I accompany them in their journey to finding, finding their own sexuality. And now, the result is, on one side, I have coaching clients who I guide in long programs um, to find their own sexual self. And on the other side, I have honest uh, escort relationships built on trust and connection. And looking back to this development, and looking to my motivation, I thought, well, what guided me? What would drive me to do this? And really, it was all about gaining more pleasure. More pleasure for me, more pleasure for the other, which also equals in more pleasure for me. Last year, I came um, across the term pleasure, term pleasure activist. It's not something I uh, found out. It's uh, a book called Pleasure Activism from Adrienne Marie Brown. And I really recommend you reading this because it's a collection of essays of the importance of pleasure, especially for minority, minorities. Um, but it's really given an int interesting perspective in uh, how you can integrate pleasure in your day-to-day -day life. Well, that word determines for me. And when I was preparing this lecture for you guys, because this isn't, isn't something I normally do, um, I was looking for the five, five easy steps to gain more happy sex and something great that, could, that would evilly give, give to you and you should know, okay, this is what I've got to do to, to be there. But I couldn't figure out <laughs> those exact five steps because it's a consciously mindfulness, being mindful of what you feel, of what you think and the way you communicate. And to start with that, I noticed you have to be able to be in your body, like I was struggling with my anxiety just now, <laughs> and had to come back to my body to be fully present in this moment. Um, and it made me think of my first coaching client. Um, let's call her Wendy for today. It's not her real name. I'm not using real names because privacy is important. Um, and she was my first female client a white woman in her 50s. She was a mother of a son of six, and she had a happy marri marri marriage. <laughs> um, but she also had a fuller figure and had breast su surgery due to breast cancer. So she really wasn't that confident with her body. She had certain beliefs about what a body sexy body should look like, and also what um, sexy and arousal should look like. So when I started working with her, we started to uh, look at what she thought about her own body and about the way arousal should look like. And this is something you can do at home also. Just stand in front of the mirror, maybe in lingerie, maybe in an outfit, maybe naked, just do what you feel comfortable with, and look at yourself. And start noticing the things that you like, and also notice the things, the places where you most rather would want to look away. And notice what you say to yourself, what thoughts do you have about those points. And it's not the reason, it's not my... Um, um, goal is not to have you totally love your body. And I don't want to say you need to have the perfect body or complete self-love. It's an acceptance in your body 
to feel in your body, to be able to be there and feel the sensations. Because what happened with Wendy is when she was insecure about her body, she didn't want to be noticed. And therefore, she didn't want to take up too much space. She would, didn't want to be seen by her partner. So when they had sex, she made it completely about him and not about her pleasure. And she also didn't take the time to explore herself because she didn't want to be confronted with her body. So we started by uh, practicing acceptance, then self-love, and taking up more space and communicating her pleasure. And also, being okay with your body isn't always the only thing that keeps you from being in your body. Sometimes we had bad experiences with sex. Sometimes some people didn't even have the chance to experience being in their body yet. And their first experience with sex was something in their head. That's how they learned to experience it. In the second half of my career, I had a regular customer. Let's call him Ronnie for today. And he was a young guy in his 30s, very kind. And he had a very neat home, like the interior with family pictures above the TV. And when I talked to him, he really didn't come loose and the conversation just kind of went dead. But when we started to have sex, oh my God, there was some kind of porn actor in this man. He just started to do all these kind of things, say all these kind of things. And I went along with it, uh, especially back then, I didn't really mind and just went with the flow. And I see this in a lot of mostly young men. They, th they have this kind of idea on how they have to be during sex. It's a, it's a role, it's a, it's a character, and they act it out. But they don't really feel in their body what they experience at the moment. And so with him, what was especially peculiar is that when he, he started to go to climaxing, he started to cuss and call me all kinds of names without even negotiating or taking notice of me. He seemed to completely disappear, going to this cussing mode and came. And after a few times, I asked him, well, is this the only way you can come? Is this how you also always do it? And then he told me he was sexually abused as a kid. And after that, his only sexual experience was with prostitutes. Because that was the only way he thought he could have sex. And actually, he was looking for intimacy and a connection. But he didn't know how to start that up. Because being connected with someone didn't feel safe. So after that, we did some practices. We had a, lot, a few dates where we tried different things. And then he came to the conclusion that he didn't want to pay for dates anymore. He wanted to go out, meet other people. I never seen him then, but he sent me a message via Twitter a year later or so, uh, that he had found a partner, a male partner living in distances, and negotiated their own way of having a relationship with freedom and connection in their own terms. And of course, sexual trauma is a really big thing. And if you have sexual trauma and you want to explore a different way of connecting with someone, I advise you see a therapist, a sexologist, or a body logical sex worker, because there is a way to get through it and feel more in your body. Hopefully, for most of us, this isn't the case. But, Fear is a big thing. And some of us, and I think all of us maybe, have had um, not so good experience or even bad experiences at sex. Being penetrated too early. Uh. <laughs> Being penetrated too early. You couldn't perform the way you should have 
come too quick, come too long, so many different things you can be scared about. And what's possible when you have these kind of experiences, that you don't want to feel the emotion, you don't want to feel the fear. And what happens, because we feel emotions in our body, we go inside of our heads, so we don't have to feel it. Also, a big thing about fear is, it keeps us from communicating honestly. At the beginning of this year, I had a coaching client. Um, he was in my program called Ease Into It. And he's a guy into software, also in his 30s. And before the COVID crisis, I had the luxury and the honor to in initiate him into the world of sex. And from the start, he was really, really into giving me oral sex. Even when I didn't even want to receive it, when I was not, wasn't not for, that up for it. And that raises the question, who is really giving and who is really receiving if I didn't really want to receive it at the moment? It was for him. So during this uh, program with him, I started practicing with the Wheel of Consent. And the Wheel of Consent is a framework. It's made by Dr. Betty Martin. And it divides um, in a wheel <laughs> for the giver, the receiver, the taker, and the allower. And it splits it in two for who it is for, and who is doing it. And it's a great framework to practice with. If you want to see more about it, there's a lot of videos online. And in the Netherlands, there's Marielle Spronk, who gives workshops about this. So you can practice uh, asking for what you want, and also practice with saying no. Um, so I started practicing these kind of things um, with this man. Let's call him Wesley. And, um, we did this game where we sat in front of each other and I would ask him a lot of questions. Can I touch you this way? Do you want me kissing you? And he only could say no. And another way around, he could say yes. And by doing so, he noticed there was a deeper desire in what he actually wanted to experience. He really wanted to experience to be in taken with a strap on. He wanted to have anal sex, but he never thought about that that was an option for him. Maybe because he is a straight man, and straight men shouldn't have anal sex. And instead of asking and thinking or feeling about what he wanted, he hid it behind giving me something. Well, not actually giving me something. And as you look back to the examples that I gave today, they all had kind of stories and beliefs in their head about what sexiness and sex should look like for them. Wendy believed that a sexy woman should, should look a certain way and that her arousal should be spontaneous and in the moment. Ronnie believed um, that his only way to receive intimacy was to have hard porn sex. And Wesley, I called him Wesley, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> Wesley, Wesley believed um, that the only way he could receive something was by give and give and give and give. Um, and really, that's something I want to give to you. There are as many ways of having good sex as there are persons and moments and combinations of them. So I want to invite you, from now on, to practice, to feel in your body, be in the moment, be aware of what you want, what you don't want, to be mindful of what you're saying and how you're communicating and what you're thinking about your body and about the others. And if you keep practicing this, you will find your own way of having happy sex. That was it. <laughs>We said thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us today. As you said, it's not, it's of course, 
yeah, out of the box for you yeah. when you compare it to your regular job, whereas I guess for most of us, it's sort of the other way around, at least. <laughs> We're more familiar in, of course, being in a classroom um, than being in the line of work that you are. Um, so I don't know if there are already some questions here in the room for Lisette, um, either about, of course, the things you've just mentioned or about your work. I think that's also okay, right, to, uh, yeah, sure. to ask some questions about sure. your work. I see one here, and I think we also have some online questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a catch box, there you go. Yeah, um, because you, um, you were talking about um, what you want in, in the moment mm -hmm. and uh, like realizing it with yourself, but um, of course everyone is different. You also said that. So um, how do you find, that's always what I'm struggling with, is how do you find a good balance between um, doing something for the other or doing something for yourself? Or are you saying that should never be the case? Sure, what was the last thing you said? Or, or are you saying that it should never be the case that you have to, to switch between these like oh, compromises? No. I think in real life, because when you practice like in the wheel of consent, it's, it's really balanced out. But in real life, you just, um, just um, you switch a lot of times. And what I can advise you is to keep evaluating uh, with yourself and maybe with the, your partners or partner that you have. Um, and how it felt for you afterwards. It's good. So, because maybe during sex, sometimes um, you can be so excited and in the moment, and um, or maybe not, not, don't feel safe and just uh, go in a pattern of giving, which is all okay because we're, we're human and things. Um, but if you want to develop in that and, and want to, to be more balanced, then evaluate and give each other feedback. and start practicing with someone you feel safe in. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? I see, yeah, I see two. Maybe if you can move to the middle, and then <laughs> after that we move thing. to you, yeah. Okay. Um, so you said something about uh, that you advise us to not be in our heads, but more in our bodies uh, during sex. So. How would you do that? Do you have some more yeah. practical tips yeah, on how that one. works? Because it sounds good, good but it's big. Yeah. You're in a room full of people <laughs> working with their heads a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 and I get that. Um, um, what really helps for me, um, and also works with my clients, um, is to go back to the sensations that you have at the moment. And it's okay when you drift off in your mind. Don't be too harsh on yourself, but... When you notice that, just go back to what you're feeling. And maybe if there isn't something that, that really can get your attention, then do something. Like for me, it's some kind of fabric or a, a, some kind of touch that really works to go back to my sensations and go back to my body. Okay, yeah. thanks. Behind you, yeah. <coughs> um, hello, uh, my question is about uh, during the sex with another partner, uh, if you don't want it some way, uh, will you bravely reject it? Or in some ways, you could make a harmonious between these? Um, oh, you can make it harmonious? Is that what you yeah, realize? Yeah, it's, uh, it's more like uh, when you are having sex with another one. Um, uh, for example, the person you mentioned, he, they, uh, he eager to give you something, but uh, actually you don't want to receive it. Yeah. In that case, should you reject it, or in some ways to? Well, it depends. Push it um, if if you look at the wheel, which I'm really uh, a supporter of, um, you don't always have to be really excited to receive it. I can allow something, and then it's in the take and uh, take and allowing um, part of the. But I'm not really an expert of the wheel, but. Um, in, in, my, in my work, and maybe sometimes in parf private, it's okay for me to have somebody do something with my body that I don't really necessarily en enjoy for um, receiving it, but I enjoy it because I can allow it for the other and the other one gets pleasure from it. Okay. Well, uh, will you, it <laughs> yeah. will you, uh, did you fake some? No, I don't fake it. I'm, I'm honest about, well... Um, it's good, but it's for you. Instead of, yeah, I really want that too, oh. and it's for me. 
Okay. It's, it's about more being honest about who it is for and who is actually receiving the act uh, in that matter. But it's something you have to uh, decide on your own in the moment because, yeah, of course you can say no if you don't want something uh, to happen. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Let's see if there are some questions uh, via Mentimeter, maybe? There, there's one question which is a bit more focused on your experience as an escort and especially as an escort uh, agent, I would say, uh, which is what does it take to become a male escort at an agency? Is it more competitive than women? But if it's too far off of the... Sorry, what, what does it take to become an escort? What then? does it take to become a male a escort? Male escort. Is it more competitive than for women? Hmm. Yeah, I think it is, but it's not my expertise. Um, um, I think the work is a lot different. Depends on how you do it, of course. And if you want to do, also have dates with other males or non-binary people or only just women, it's um, a different kind of setting up your website and marketing. And uh, so I, I think it's more competitive. Um, and I think you have to be more clear about what you have to offer to someone. Did you have male escorts in your agency at some point? Yes, I did. Um, but it's, it is easier to have um, work if you also uh, want to date with men. All right. <laughs> Could be an unexplored market still, do you think? Um, yeah, because we're more me, used because, to yeah. female escorts, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Traditionally. Yeah. And I think um, maybe people are interested already. I don't. Know. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, yeah. could that could that also be uh, some a factor that's involved here that we're so used to uh, female sex workers as opposed to male because of the way because of our history basically where pleasure for men has always oh yeah I think more in, in society um, the norms per sex are per sex per, per gender. Are, are very different. Mm -hmm. So what I found in my work is that it's way more normal for guys to pay for sex than pay for intimacy. Um, and also, so sex can be li like the, the... What's the exact difference like between the two for you? Um, ooh, <laughs> good question. Um, there's no exact difference. But it's um, I think it's a more it's a different way to describing something, and I think also that um, when males buy sex, they buy some fantasy, and then the after the intimacy come, comes later um, and I think um because that is that is more safer for men to say, I want to have sex instead okay. of I want to cuddle someone. Um, but those are combined, so I couldn't really yeah. give an answer to that. No, <laughs> this is just very interesting to, that you that you consider them separately, of course. That's mm. uh, also what you've been discussing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> are there any questions on this side of the room, maybe? I see one hand up there. If we can throw the catch box. <laughs> yeah, good throw. <laughs> Little applause here for you, yeah. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you've had any experience with trans or non-binary people, because I think we can experience those confidence issues for uh, very different reasons than most others. Yeah, I do have experience with non-binary non people, um, but yeah, per, per percentage is way smaller than um, binary people. Um, but I think you're exactly right, and I think what I've seen, the non-binary people I've known, are way more conscious about the insecurities, about fears they're feeling, about coping mechanisms, um, which for me, it made it really great to communicate and uh, give them a safe space. And yeah. Thank right. you. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Someone else or Mentimeter? Yeah? On? Oh, yeah. yeah. So as soon as uh, there was one online question, a lot of them came in. Okay, uh, There's a lot about sexuality, um, either yourself or your, your partner. I think maybe a question that kind of encapsulates 
Several of them is how do you ask your partner what they want, maybe in the broadest sense, if they have very little experience and have difficulty uh, imagining things they want to experience. Mm. Uh, in that case, I suggest you, you play a game. Uh, set a timer in 30 minutes, an hour, just tell what you want. And let the other decide um, what you can do. And you can start with playing with ice cubes or feathers or whatever. Uh, and be creative, you can ask anything in this time. And of course, the one giving can say no or can say, well, I, don't, I do want to do this, but only on these terms. And just start exploring. And if that doesn't work, I experienced this also with uh, the guy I named Wesley, Wesley today. <laughs> I don't know why I picked that name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and he... Um, he froze when he had the opportunity to completely ask me anything. He didn't know what to do. Um, and then we took a step back and I just said, okay, well, I'm a doll. Use my body in, in ways you'd like to. And that became a fun game. We started laughing and fooling around. And then he became more confident in, okay, I can ask you things and you say no when you don't want things and that's a, fa a safe space. Uh, and you can also turn it around and just as a partner of someone who doesn't really know what they like, say, okay, I'm gonna start doing things with you, and you're gonna st say, no, if you don't like it, or please do it this way if you want it another way. And in that way, you can just explore and just be creative in what you're gonna do to each other. All right, is there time for, for one more question? Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. You touched upon this a little bit in, in the lecture. But what can you do to create a safe space, a safe sexual space after sexual trauma? Touch a yeah. little bit if you want to touch on that. <laughs> sounds a bit like more. a difficult question. It does yeah. sound like a difficult question. Yeah. Um, so I know a bit about trauma, but I'm not really an expert. But what's always important, and I think way more important when you had trauma or your partner had trauma. Um, is there to be room to always say no, to always quit, to always say, no, I don't feel it anymore, and don't be disappointed about that. So for me, personally, I can experience when I start having sex with someone, I don't always have the option to say, no, I don't want it anymore, because oh, you, <laughs> you started already. But that's always an option, and especially when you had trauma, it's... Um, uh, good to make that clear that it's th that it's not a problem if you don't want to go on anymore or it doesn't feel good anymore. Um. Can you advise people on where to go if they want to look for professional help in that department? Or? Um, yeah, I would prefer a sexual a sexuological body work because they they trauma sets sets itself in the body. Uh, and you experience it <laughs> in your body. Uh, and with sexual sexuological body work, they really look at your body's reaction to some kind of touch and how you can regulate your nervous system. Um, but I do, yeah, I do not yeah, have okay. any names now. So. Yeah, no, fair <laughs> enough. We have a few minutes left. Are there further questions? Yeah, you already have the catch box. Yeah, I already have it. Uh, so the question is, you mentioned this before, but uh, you don't necessarily, uh, you, as you said, you don't necessarily need to love yourself 100%, is what you said, uh, love your body 100%. Um, would you be able to like elaborate a bit more on that uh, in the sense of perhaps there is something that I want to change about my body, that I will change about my body, but I would still love, I would still want to love my body uh, before I do or while I do, while I'm not still where I want to be. Would you have any advice in that direction? Yeah, um, I do, I think. Uh, what works for me is what I also said, um, to think and be grateful for uh, that my body is able to receive pleasure and to give pleasure and just be happy about that. And that isn't about... Um, aesthetical beauty, but it's a beauty in itself that it's able to do that. 
and that really works for me. And uh, as a practice, you can um, practice maybe daily to be with those body parts, lay your hands on them, be kind, like you would be to uh, a small animal or a little child and just be, oh, okay, you're with me, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Are there perhaps any last Mentimeter questions? <laughs> We've time for one. If you could go back in time and choose another occupation, would you do so? No. Well, thanks. I think that's a very nice way uh, <laughs> to end Thank this you. lecture. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much for being with us here today and for sharing your experiences so openly. I think it's an invitation for all of us to uh, get out of our heads a little more. And um, you mentioned the pleasure activism. I really like that term. Maybe we can all become a bit of a pleasure activist ourselves. Um, so thanks very much, Lisa. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, tonight, for Studium Generale, we have a very interesting movie about something completely different, but that's Studium Generale, about the situation in Ukraine. And we also have a job opening. You're here with a lot of people. If you would like to work for us, please have a look at our website. That would be great. And we'd like to see you again next week. Thanks. <laughs>